Welcome to Star Grind Entrepreneurship Story. It's Thursday morning and we have an entrepreneur here with us today. Welcome, Christopher. Mm, thank you. Uh, Entrepreneurship Stories is uh, organized by Star Grind, which is an organization working with tech enhancement empowerment of young tech entrepreneurs. And we have a program that goes this fall. And one of the things that we organize is entrepreneurship stories. And we do this together with uh, Uppsala Municipality. We do it together with Uppsala University, EIT Health, and Entrepreneurstaden, AB, as well as Rotary. And today we have a Rotarian or a Rotarian associate here together with us. Most welcome, and we are looking forward to welcome more senior. So uh, let's dive into your journey, your entrepreneurship journey. So Christopher, I asked you how to introduce you, and you said, well, I'm an investor and a salesperson. Would you like to expand on that a bit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think... Uh, I mean, uh, I've come to that age when I can look back and say I have done a lot of different, uh, different things. But actually, when I <coughs> to simplify a little bit, you can say I've basically only done one thing all my life. I've been selling. So that's kind of the sales thing. And uh, that makes it easy also for my mother because she always asked me, she always started asking me when I was 16, what are you kind of, what are you doing? And I said, no, I'm selling stuff. And she really likes that because that's still the answer. <laughs> uh, today I'm selling companies. Uh, when I was 16, I was selling something else. So uh, I'm a salesperson. I think that's, uh, uh, that's the explanation of that. Do you remember the first thing you started to sell when you were 16? Uh, no, not 16, but I think uh, the sales journey started when I was selling, I actually don't know the translation of my bloomer. Okay, no, me neither. <laughs> It's a small flower <laughs> we sell uh, in Sweden for Charity. Yeah, for charity. Yeah. Supporting poor kids, uh, uh, something like that. Yeah. But that was really, really fun uh, selling. I don't really know when that happened. Maybe I was 10 or 12 or, or, mm. or uh, something. And, and that kind of uh, youth story ended up a little bit later when I was like 16, 17 and I was running a, a nightclub in, uh, in Stockholm uh, using one of my friend's older sister. She needed to sign all contracts since you were not allowed to sign any contracts. But that would actually grow from being just something for some friends. Then we then, almost for two years, between I was 16 and 18, was running every Saturday, 900 people, fully booked every, every Saturday. So uh, that kind of started my, uh, my appetite for uh, business, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> okay. But your first job was not in, in companies and business, was it? No, not at all. Very, very unexpected. After this nightclub journey, I was thinking business is my thing. So Stockholm School of Economics, that's, that's the thing for me. Uh, but this is, you know, in the end of the 80s. Uh, and that time, Sweden has uh, still had conscript service. So every male person was supposed to do a year in the army. Uh, that was how, how it worked. So of course, uh, I needed to do that uh, as well. And uh, making a long story short, it ended up that I stayed in the army for almost 10 years and become an, uh, as, as an officer, platoon commander, battalion commander, and uh, uh, retired as a, as a captain. And uh, yeah, and then... But so you stayed 10 years in the army. What, wh how, how, what was the transition? What made you leave the army? Because it's actually a quite... You know, as I understood, I never made it into the army, but it's, it's, a, it's a very strong companionship and it's a, it's <coughs> a, it's a good job. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. So, uh, now there was this family thing. Uh, it's, it's a lifestyle. It also means that when you met a nice uh, girl and you say, oh, I want to meet her again, and then you need to look in the calendar and said, in three weeks, I am back. <laughs> so, could we have a next date on Tuesday evening? but not too late because I need to go up at 4.15 on <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> Based okay. on that, it was really hard to kind of build a relationship. So uh, I was thinking it could be fun to meet girls more than once. Okay. Uh, so that was basically the main reason why I left the army. And, and when you, and okay, so you decided to leave the army. So, so what did you do? Yeah, 
Uh, this isn't the Was it somebody hunting you, had hunting <coughs> you, or were you like yeah, looking? Yeah, kind, kind of. This is in the mid, mid of the 90s. And the IT industry in Sweden has uh, grown a lot. It was exp exponential growth. Uh, and uh, was the all these tech companies that grow and become big companies and they were kind of screaming for leaders. In uh, 1996, the Swedish army made a huge cut down. And as in all business, the best one is leaving first. Uh, so in 98, 99, when I was looking for, for leaving the army, in almost all big IT companies in Sweden, there was at least 30 or up to 50 percentage of the management team was former army officers. Yeah. So it was very natural for me for leaving the army for going directly to the IT industry. With contacts, have you had contacts there that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I think we are star grinders who sit here among yeah. us wonder like, okay, so how do you actually make yeah. this transition? So how, wh what were you thinking? Um, it yeah, it was actually, and I was very, very lucky because it's, it, this is a timing issue. And I was, all entrepreneurs know it's everything about timing. So this was an in IT industry was, was growing a lot. There was some really skilled tech people, but there was really no management culture in the IT industry at that time. So they were really looking for, for, for leaders. And at this time, uh, and I had my former colleagues, and uh, two of them has started working as management consultants and they have found him a very interesting concept about strategic outsourcing. It actually means that an IT company takes over everything <laughs> from another company about their IT operations. I mean, uh, today is this the, the default alternative. Everyone is doing this. In the mid of 90s, this was very innovative. I, I understand that you can't understand it, that it, but at that time it was innovation. Today is the, the default alternative. This is what that is what happens with innovation if it's good. Yeah, if it's, if <laughs> it's good. Uh, I mean, so this is basics. Uh, and IT outsourcing is mostly about leadership, organizational, and enforcing processes. And that's basically what you do as an army officer. So it was uh, pr pretty easy. So we were three people. Uh, I actually left the army on a Tuesday. And on the Thursday, I started the, in the IT with a meeting with uh, the city of Stockholm, who, who is the largest municipality in, uh, in Sweden. And in somehow, don't, don't ask me how, uh, my two former other colleagues had to make a PowerPoint that uh, somehow we were able to present for, Stockholm, for the city of Stockholm that we were able to take care of their IT organization. So we were actually only three people. We made that sales. It was a 70 million uh, crowns contract in stage one. Uh, so we won that. Uh, three persons. Yeah, three persons. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we grew uh, kind of super, super fast. I okay. will also add that we were at that time working together as the first investor with a company called Mercantil Data, who is at that time was one of the largest, uh, fastest growing uh, IT companies in, in the Nordics. Uh, but it was a Norwegian company. And they were really interested of this market uh, in Sweden. So that was the thing. So my kind of startup journey was a little bit strange. Uh, from Tuesday to Thursday, uh, two weeks later, we closed this contract. And then we were growing uh, like hell. <laughs> uh, and what does that mean? I mean, for someone who hasn't, you know, are about to start their entrepreneurship journey as these 11, 15 star grinders here taking this program. What does it mean to grow as hell for you? <laughs> Sorry for the word. <laughs> <coughs> we had the customer, and that's always the most difficult thing as, as a startup, to get your first customer. And, and then we had the process in PowerPoint. So we just needed to add the people. And when I, I was a people person, that was my thing. <laughs> We'd done, done for 10 years, so we, uh, yeah, we just and since we had the, the money in place, it was pretty easy to recruit. The problem when you're a startup and you need to recruit is that you can't pay any salaries. We had the money for all the salaries. We just needed to find the people. That was a really, really good uh, short shortcut. So we become 30, 70, and then uh, together with Mercantile Data, we could uh, uh, acquire some companies within the Mercantile Data group to move to our outsourcing company. So we were like 1,000 people after a shorter time than two years. And uh, at that time, then uh, uh, Mercantile Lotta kind of we merged with uh, uh, Mercantile Lotta. Okay. Uh, and then the company, make a short, long story short, no. uh, then the company uh, changed, uh, then the IT crash come. 
Uh, and since we were an outsourcing company and we had a monthly agreement and yearly payment, we were super profitable all, all the way through this dot-com crash. And when all the other IT companies crashed, there was lots of super competent and skilled people to recruit. Really cheap, because they were unemployed. <laughs> uh, so we could grow uh, a lot. And at that time we merged with my big mercantile data, and so we had all the resources needed. Uh, and then after IT crash, we changed name to Ementor. Uh, we were uh, acquired some Danish companies and we were looking on, and now we're back to innovation, how we threw software, because this was like internal e-commerce. And today, when I, everyone knew what e-commerce is, and you have been said, this was also innovation because there didn't exist any e-commerce sites. So we made like a business to business e-commerce side that made it possible for us to trade hardware on a global business on a global scale. It was meaning that if we could find cheap computers in Slovenia, we could kind of uh, uh, put a bid on that, and while that bid was still in the air, we could sell those computers to a municipality in Sweden. Uh, cheaper than, uh, for example, HP, who is a big computer company at that time. We could sell HP computers cheaper in Sweden than HP could do themselves, because okay. we're acting on a global market, and this was kind of uh, created by software. Uh, a software, software solution. So where are we in time now? How long have you been working? Uh, th this is uh, this amazing thing. This is just uh, now we are uh, that close coming close to uh, 2000. So it's a shorter, shorter journey than, than, ten, than 10 years from uh, we start, started that one. And if we look at how you grew, you were three and then within 10 years, how big was the company? Or within, uh, within two <coughs> years, how big was the company? And then uh, we were almost 2000 uh, in, in two, two years. And but then, of course, we merged with, with our investor, you could say, or our mother, my mother. And uh, then I was there working, uh, working with this new software thing of sourcing uh, uh, hardware globally. Uh, we acquired a Danish company, getting a new investor who, uh, who could push in a lot more capital in the company. Okay. And at that time, the old Swedish uh, uh, company, VM Data, were selling their hardware division. Uh, and we were thinking, shit. If a global competitor, sorry for that. <laughs> if a global competitor will buy this other, the, Nord, the giant in the Nordics, then we will be have problems because they will be much bigger than us in a global customer relationship. So we kind of sold off some parts of our own company and acquired this uh, hardware uh, company, and that brand still exists, uh, and that is Atia, and that's a pretty well-known company in, in Sweden today. And the group become the third largest IT company in Europe measured in uh, revenue. So, uh, we, we're going to ask Lucas for a favor here. Can you let me know when time is five to eight? Because mm. at eight, we're going to start up a Q&A session. So, like, if you have questions, remember them. And we're going to take questions from online also, from our Zoom uh, participants also. And the write your questions in the chat, and we will ask Mia to read them out for us. Yeah. So, so that's kind of my journey from a really small army, really small company to actually a pretty big company. It was an interesting journey. So um, this is actually something I would like to dig into a little bit together with you. Uh, what is the big difference to going, you know, being a small entrepreneur for three persons yeah. and then growing? Uh, but actually, you did you were not that small for a very long time. Within two years, you were a large yeah, company yeah, already, yeah. but for entrepreneurs sitting here and the mindset and the business arena, wha what do you think about, because you made a journey. Yeah. And you actually made one <coughs> step more that we haven't touched upon yet. No, no, uh, uh, exactly. So, uh, and I'm going in, a, going in a circle there, you could say, yeah. but. but um, should we should we should we go should to that part before yeah, we go? We let let's come, yeah, let's <laughs> do that. We, let's so. <coughs> Let's go to what happened after, because you didn't stay in this company. No, I didn't stay in that company because I'm a software and tech guy, and now we have and, and just to finance these hardware acquisitions, we were selling off the out uh, outsourcing division and also the software developers, a and um, you know we had our around uh, 1,100 software developers. They were kind of they were my kids, <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I left the group at that time, uh, following uh, one of my former ar army colleagues to IBM, where he became the uh, uh, one of the European CEOs. So then I uh, start. But when you left the company, what position did you have then in that company? 
I was responsible for uh, strategic outsourcing and software development. Okay. So I was in the group management. Yeah. So that was as an employee, a regular, honest job. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was easy to explain for your mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then you went into and uh, got uh, a job in IBM. And what did you do there? Yeah, I was country manager for the middleware divisions. Uh, it means uh, data integration, business analytics, databases, uh, you know, everything a big bank has, but you can't see. That's uh, that kind of software. Uh, I was running that uh, three and a half year, and then I couldn't stand anymore. Uh, with that said, IBM is an amazing company. I don't regret I worked there. I learned a lot, but uh, it uh, was at that time uh, more than 500,000 employees, and I was not the most important employee, uh, and Sweden was definitely not the most important country. So uh, there was a little bit, we were really squeezed into the box. That's yeah. your box, be there, mm -hmm. stay there. Don't do anything else outside that box. So but the innovator in you, and creator in you needed to do something else. Yeah, abs uh, yeah I mean, exa 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 exactly. So, uh, uh, at that so that's the reason why I started uh, the, uh, my, 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 my private, or what you say, the, a small investment company. So, focusing on, uh, actually looking on, on Swedish tech companies that with really good technology, uh, where kind of the problem was sales. So I was thinking, wow, this is really cool tech. I can sell this. And if I can sell it, I can invest in the company. Easy as that. So you're both investor and seller, which basically means you made the circle. Yeah. <laughs> now, now we're going <laughs> now to the circle. Now I'm getting now it. Now you're back to, back to the circle. So I've been okay. selling all the time. I mean, that's, uh, that's basically what you do. Okay. Uh, even if you're selling companies or you're doing a fundraising or whatever, I mean, it's, it's all about sales. Uh, and I, I also pretty narrow, I, I really stayed around business to business, enterprise software and deep tech. So what are you doing today? Yeah, basically uh, two, two things. Uh, uh, first, uh, I still have the venture where we invest in, in promising uh, Nordic uh, or Swedish technology companies where we think there is a sales problem. <laughs> we have things if we could sell, uh, then we could invest. Easy as that, very simple idea. And then some years ago, 2014, I worked with some uh, in some uh, venture projects with raising money in China. At that time, that was super easy. That has changed a lot. Uh, so I got really interested of, of the Chinese uh, market. I also met uh, one of my my, uh, my partners now, uh, who uh, has been working and living in USA for a long time. And I mean, uh, the traditional route is taking your companies to USA. You start in Stockholm and then you from you start in Gotsunda and then you go to Silicon Valley. That's kind of that's how it works. Yeah. And it's been that for thirty years. Uh, that machine is not working as good as, as it had. So we'll start looking for alternative. And I mean, uh, the next decade is the decade of Asia. There is where the growth is, there is everything. If you're just looking for enterprise software, for example, uh, if you're looking on the whole enterprise software, who's the largest ICT market in the world and you remove the legacy, things that were the customers bought last year, they're just looking for growth. The Chinese market is as big as the rest of the earth. So that is, of course, an interesting market. So then we started a, a venture of uh, investing in Nordic tech companies going to China for uh, growth. And now this is interesting, the timing. We always <laughs> talk to entrepreneurs <laughs> about timing. So we are started that like two years ago when everyone said, yeah, it's China, super exciting, go there. And then basically when we started, we got the trade war, we got Trump, uh, we got a lot of political conflict, and then we got Corona. <laughs> yeah. So. so how are you coping with that? <coughs> you could, uh, we have the privilege as a startup to uh, be a little bit more sustainable and we also have other business legs of course. Okay. So it could stand there, but you're absolutely right that has had that been the only thing we were doing then we would have been in really big problems right now. Yeah. Because uh, this uh, situation we had last semester with Corona coming really had an impact on our startups who are, some of them are just booming, blooming, you know, mm -hmm. being right in time yeah. 100% and some are, are, are disappearing. And you are working as an investor here. So how were you thinking at that time? W like, wh what were you thinking when you were investing? 
this is this is super interesting for anyone who's going. For <laughs> first, I would, would say be, be because you put some strategy in that. If it's difficult, there is also a business opportunity. That's true if we were as entrepreneurs. It's true for markets and, and things like that. If it's everything is easy, then all the big the big players in the world will be there. And so you there is no play there is no room for small players. <laughs> So you need to find something that is really difficult and overcome it, and that there is huge opportunities. Uh, and then if you ask me as an investor, if I'm going to what I'm looking for to close the circle a little bit yeah. in, in companies, is basic is two things. First, uh, will they be able to do the scale-up journey yes. that from small to big? Now we're and then we have a model that for that. Yeah. And the other thing, of course, is that are they sales-focused? Because if you don't have customers, you will sooner or later die. If you're not a deep tech company that get your findings from the government, that's a different story. But otherwise, you need customers. Otherwise, you will just die. So scaling. Let's go back to that yeah. one. And, and let's go back to the question I asked when I made a detour. <laughs> well, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. pivoted in this <laughs> interview. <laughs> yeah. uh, but let's go back to the question about being a small startup and being you know, a large company and even a global company. What, what, what learnings do you have? You've been on these, all of these yeah, steps yeah, yeah. and today you're investing. So like how, what, what are the learnings you would like to share yeah. with? There is a huge amount of theories around that and is a, you can read at least a thousand books. I have a very simplified model uh, that I usually use when I'm evaluating a company or when, I, when I'm mentoring an entrepreneur. That when you and me meet and we have a brilliant idea together, then we form like a rock band. Bang, bang, bang. bang. You're yeah. singing or I am singing yeah. and I'm, you're doing the guitar and we probably know our roles. And then we need someone who do the keyboard and that's you. That's yeah. the keyboard. We bring in. Yeah, we bring in, in there, <laughs> and now we have an orchestra, and it, everything. It's mm. it's uh, it's great. It's our rock band. But then we grow a little bit more, and then we start into actually becoming a family. We need some brothers and sisters, some uh, some smaller kids, and uh, maybe we need some uh, uh, grandmother or grandfather in, in like an advisory board. Mm. But we're still a they family, and they want structure. Yeah, and we want we're a family, but. So we have a structure, but maybe it's not documented because it's obvious, you know, when the grandfather says something that you, you should listen and uh, it's obvious, you know, it's, the, it's never stated anywhere, but it's the mother in the family who's make all real decisions when it comes to the hard ends, you know, at least in my family, it's my wife who takes important decisions. So, but you don't really have, you need, don't need to have the rule book in place. You need to have processes. So that's the family. And this is a very, very pleasant thing. And most entrepreneurs uh, or startups that is raising kind of second seed or A round or something, they are a family. Yeah. What and is the really second seed? I, the first seed is maybe you, this is financing. First, maybe you got some money from uh, the local incubator at the university and then you bring in some angel or something. That's kind of seed investments. And A is when you actually go into an investment company or a VC company asking for, for money. Yeah. Uh, VC stands for venture capital. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's 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 how it is. So family is really good, but the problem with a family, and this is your private life, and I think it is that there is some barriers against the rest of the world, and the family works really fine. Uh, you have acceptance, you forgive each other, and those things. But in the next step, you need to become an office, and an office is when you actually have real employees that you don't really know. And you're, you have the, you know, the responsibility of having employees. And the employees have problems that they come that you need to solve. And, uh, and maybe they don't perform, so you actually need to fire someone. And all these things suddenly requi require processes and a more formal leadership. And it's also painful because suddenly a small group of people is going to eat lunch without inviting you. Because they don't want to have you, because they want to talk about you, because you are their manager. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really painful. <laughs> the journey of not being a family anymore. And yeah. you can't really trust people in the same sense that you can do in a family. So that's the office. And then the problem comes when you're supposed to be global, or you need to grow from Gotsunda, both to Stockholm and uh, and uh, Gävle and uh, Gothenburg. You suddenly have people that you can't see 
that you can't meet. You need to have an office manager. What is the responsibility for the guy who is running Norway for you? You need to define those responsibilities. You need to have a process. You need to have, you know, lots of things. And suddenly you need to focus on, on that thing. And that's needed for it to scale on, on scale globally. Uh, and this is a really painful, uh, painful uh, journey. Mm. And one more thing that I'm always looking for, because the most dangerous thing is when you're going from a family to become an office. There is a shortcut. If you're a dynamic leader, you can, instead of becoming an office, instead of building a scalable structure, you can just stand up on the stage and you can, you can become the great leader. And then you become a, like a religious sect. <laughs> everything is depending on you because you are this half god that knows everything. And that works fine. You can probably drive, you know, 70 people, like maybe 100. And if you are, if you're so really fun. charismatic, you can probably go, grow a little bit bigger than that. But then it fails. So you are not an investment case. You will probably make a super profitable business and you can make an exit. But you are not like an invest investment case. You will get stuck there in this sect thing. So that's a trap or a strategy. The difference is that if you don't know that you have become a sect, you're a failure. If that was your plan, you're a super success. <laughs> so once again, it's a mindset thing. It's a mindset <laughs> thing. It's a mindset thing. And then coming back to what kind of company I want to run now as yeah. a small company. So now I'm looking, I will never grow bigger than a family in the business I'm doing now. For the rest yeah. of my life, I will never run anything that is bigger than a family. Yeah. You decided that. Yeah, because that's, that's most fun. Yeah. We're going to take in some questions. Do we have anyone who has any questions? Zee? Yeah, uh, I have a question. So it's a really interesting talk. So my question was about your journey from the uh, small company to the biggest company. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sounds like you were very army style kind of managerial to the business. How do you think it's going to be make any difference uh, the army style as in the company to make style kind of thing? Is it going to be any better? You have to repeat the question. Yeah, bringing like an army style. Question, or the because otherwise yeah, the, the people Yeah, the question was that how if, if could I bring my army style leadership into uh, to the business? Mm -hmm. I would say yes and yes and no. Uh, there is, I mean, there is a good thing. You know, in, in sometimes when you're in the army, you can't allow questions mm -hmm. because you you need immediate reactions because you're in a, a war situation. You can't discuss things, you just need to do it because everything about seconds. In, 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 in a private company, you actually have that time to discuss. That makes that you, as a leader, can make, you need to allow that because you can make more uh, educated decisions because you have skilled people, so you should listen on them. But something that is really good with army is that it's obvious when the discussion is over and you move into execution. And um, for those who are familiar with Swedish business culture, sometimes there is a tendency that you talk and talk and talk and talk and then you kind of forget to execute. Uh, and sometimes it's better just to do something than to think too much about the perfect solution because when you have thought out the perfect solution, it's not needed anymore. <laughs> it's not needed because it's too late. Yeah, the market is gone. The market is gone. So uh, the execution focus that, that you have in the army is, is, uh, is perfect, but you, it's not possible to translate one, one to one. Do you let me know when it's quarter past? Uh, any questions? Mia, we have some Zoom questions. Yeah. Do you repeat the question? Yeah, if outsourcing was uh, super hot in the beginning of the 90s, uh, what is uh, trending or is, is hot right now? Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. Uh, but I would say that my bet is uh, what I'm, I think is, is really hot now is, of course, applied AI. Uh, uh, on the industrial side, you could call it industry 4.0 or industrial revolution or something, but applied AI that makes automation uh, in the in industry, that's of course is, uh, 
that's w one of the really big uh, big things can i ask you because this it's about tech entrepreneurship that we are are focusing on so uh, is tech entrepreneurship something to go into today or should one look into some other areas or should one combine the areas how what are your thoughts around that now you're asking a guy that has spent, you know, 25, <laughs> the last 25 years of only doing enterprise software, <laughs> B2B and tech ent entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I think, of course, that's the place to be. Okay. Go there, stay there. And never and leave. And never leave. <laughs> that's the perfect place. Okay. <laughs> uh, do we have some more questions? Uh, Gustav? Do you repeat the question again? Yeah. Uh, the question was that the, the company uh, Gustav is in is in the transition from very exactly from being 12 peop 12 person family and now growing really fast to become kind of the, the office. Uh, the office is actually a nice, very nice. Uh, uh, what do you call it? You can find it on, on Netflix. It's a really nice American <laughs> uh, movie. Follow that. I think it's a very good education <laughs> in leadership as well. <laughs> no, to, to, be ser to be serious, I think it's uh, when you're the family, the most important thing to make that transition is actually to s be straight on who is making the decisions. Is there owners? I mean, uh, then obviously the owners, if it's only two person who, who's owning 100% of the chair, that those are the persons. And maybe there is a third person who makes the decisions. You need to straight that out. Because in the next step, the leadership needs to be much straighter, much clearer. And this is a little bit painful. Then there is a long to-do list of things where you can actually just, and I can share that list if you, uh, uh, I have made some models that I use for mentoring a startup, things you should think about, do this. But that's like a to-do list. The problem is that if you haven't answered who is making the decisions, who is in charge in the family, then it will be really hard to kind of start executing on the to-do list. Mui, you had a question. How should we cope with uh, the changing in business conditions and relationship between China and the West? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is also a really good good question. I will stay here for another three hours, and you and me could kind of deep begin begin to that question. The short the short answer is that uh, go east. I'm definitely sure that you should. Go East is a very good alternative for entrep entrepreneurs in, in, uh, in Sweden. Go East, not only going West. Going to Silicon Valley is not going global. That is just going to Silicon Valley and lose all your money. Uh, <laughs> so Go East <laughs> is super, you need to evaluate that. But Asia is much more than, uh, Southeast Asia and, and China is much more than just mainline uh, China. There is also, for those who have been there, a little bit difficult talking about China as, as one thing. There is lots of different uh, entry points to China, different way of doing it. For example, I definitely think there is a huge opportunity within susta sustainability and tech around sustainability or for that example for win winter Olympics or something. That things that I think is very uncomplicated from a political perspective of working with China. Uh, if you're uh, selling some kind of uh, semiconductors, then don't, go, don't even think about doing that in the East. <laughs> Focus on, on, on Silicon Valley, I think that's the strategy. So there is not really one, one answer on that. From a long-term perspective, if you're looking for what is interesting for the coming 20 years, I would say that 
I agree when McKinsey and Gartner and everyone that says that the coming decades belongs to Asia. And we are a small country depending on exporting our innovation. That means that the focus on going to Asia is here to stay. So what is the challenge on focusing on Asia? Wha how are we doing on time? Is it? <laughs> a quarter past. So it's time to wrap up. Okay. Oh, so we have that. Excellent. <laughs> so what are the challenges? Because China is not, you know, you know, it's not. There are some challenges of going to a country as China, with a, a not a democracy, or yeah, not a yeah. democracy basically. So what are your thoughts about that? Because this is a political question also. Yeah, I mean, I think you you need to understand that and accept that that is a problem. If you neglect it, you will be get stuck in problem. But uh, for example, if you're taking, uh, if you're looking a little bit broader perspective, if you're taking sustainability, for example, if you're looking on, on this, uh, uh, you know, the sustain the F United Nations sustainability targets, if you're looking at you know, the problem the world has right now is that we will not reach any of those targets. And 70 percentage of the reason is China. And we are very good, almost one of the leaders in developing uh, technology for a sustainable future. Should we refuse to export that technology to China to redu reduce their use of coal, uh, coal uh, in the energy sector? That sounds really stupid because then we fuck up the earth and that's a bigger problem. Yeah. Politics comes and goes within decades. But we only have one earth. So I think in that case it makes it super straight. Yeah. But there is not one answer. There's definitely things you should not do with a country like China or Saudi Arabia. But exporting uh, I mean a tre treatment for child cancer, to say something obvious. I mean, uh, is there kids on the earth that doesn't deserve treatment against yeah. cancer? Probably no. Everyone would say no. Okay, so that's safe. <laughs> yeah. That's something good. Sustainability is something good. But be aware that it's there are things that you should not do. So basically, when you go into entrepreneurship, make sure you know where you stand. Yes. Get your you know, books and your, your values in. Both feet on the ground, focus on saves. <laughs> do we have any more questions? We can take one more. Okay. Uh, you want last remark? Sales. I really like sales. So my tip to you as an entrepreneur, something that I really dislike is when I'm meeting a company with four founders and there are three vice presidents and one CEO. I would love to see that I'm the coder and then there is three salespersons. And then you can have a title. You can be the founder or the CEO or whatever, but Everybody are sales yeah. because in the end it's about customers and revenue. Yeah, exactly. And tech, of course. So I, I really yeah. like to have the developer. Three salespersons is not that good only because then you're probably selling hot air and that's, <laughs> 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 that's also a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to end up and I would like to give you the opportunity to take the last word before I say goodbye to what would you really like the audience to have with them? from our discussion today? Mm. If you love your family so much that you don't want to change, stay there. Be happy. Set your ambition to stay as a family. And this is, I remind you, this is about the business I talked about. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing <laughs> private. No. Okay. But makes that's the most important decision you make. If you don't want to be anything else, then your nice little family in your company Stay there. It could be super good. It could give you food on the table the rest of your life. Don't try to, m don't mess that up. But if you want to move on, make sure you do it. And you need to really execute and you need to make the decision and then you need to execute. You need to do the right things. That's the hardest phase in your, uh, your company's history. Thank you for coming, Christopher. Super nice to have you here. 
And to everyone, thank you for the questions. Thank you for coming up in the morning and joining us. And we will be back in two weeks with another inspiring entrepreneur here at Stargrind Entrepreneurship Stories. Have a good day. Thanks, Mikael.